Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation to speak here and thank all of you for your time. I must say, um, as I was starting out in my career, and anybody told me that I was going to go over to the dark side and work for industry, I would have never believed it. Um, so I'm kind of astonished to find myself at this point actually talking about it. Um, so I um, started out basically using a surgical device in my practice, basically for bariatric surgery. Um, as part of my relationship with the company, I started to teach that procedure and to proctor surgeons on that procedure. I collected data and with my fellow published some articles and papers and did some presentations around it. The company then asked me to join them 20% uh, time, one day a week, as the chief medical advisor. And I worked at Stanford University. They had a program where, as a faculty member, you could do that. And so I began really just interacting with the engineers, giving them my opinion on what worked in terms of an instrument or what didn't work or why it didn't work. I mean, it was great. I didn't need to have any data. It was just my opinion. Uh, one of the easiest jobs I ever had. Um, I also started um, to establish fellowship and research grant programs uh, for the company. And then I decided to take a two-year leave of absence from my faculty position and go to work for the company full-time in order to better explore uh, what that opportunity was going to be like. And again, I was very fortunate. I worked at Stanford. They had a program where you could take a two-year leave of absence but maintain your faculty position. Um, because to be honest with you, I'm not sure I would have been brave enough to just leave my practice and go work uh, for industry without knowing whether I was going to like it or whether they were going to like me or whether the company was going to survive. Uh, about six months into that two-year leave of absence, my 13-year-old daughter told me that I was so much nicer since I'd gone to work for industry, and I figured for that to penetrate the self-absorption of a teenager, I probably should listen. So at the end of the two years, I made the decision to primarily work for industry. I do still have a practice at the VA um, several days a month where I do minimally invasive surgery with a fellow and, and sometimes a resident. Right now for my company, I run our global uh, professional education group, which is training for surgeons and OR staff and nurses. I run our clinical affairs group, which does clinical studies for regulatory purposes and publication purposes. I run our medical research group, which is looking at potential areas where there could be applications for the surgical device. I have a small group of engineers who focus on training technologies like the simulator or remote mentoring, remote case observation. I also have our Health Economics and Outcomes Research Group, also a global group that looks um, at answering HTAs, pulling together data, working with databases, and doing some market access work. Uh, and finally, our Global Public Affairs Group, focusing primarily on government affairs, uh, crisis management, and advocacy. Um, although I don't run the regulatory group, I am the clinical input on our FDA submissions for our device. And this is just an example of the types of people in the company that I interact with. I still do interact with the engineers, although a lot less than I used to, and I really miss that. I spend much more time on the commercial side of the business uh, with the sales and marketing people and through them talking to outside surgeons and societies. And I am, again, kind of the clinical voice uh, for the regulatory and legal folks. And this is just kind of an example of um, what I offer to the company. So primarily, it's clinical input. What would a surgeon think about this? How would this affect a surgeon? Um, I also am a big, ad big advocate for education and training. Uh, my background at Stanford was as a surgical educator. That's how I was promoted, and I was both the residency, the associate residency program director and associate dean for graduate medical education and the medical student clerkship director. And so I have spent a lot of time at the company talking about how important it is that we invest in training and training technologies um, and that that should not be a way to to make revenue. It should be something we do to help our customers learn to get better um, at using the device. 
Um, I do uh, talk to about how surgeons think, uh, primarily from an academic point of view, because that is my focus. I've actually struggled a little bit with thinking more broadly than just from an academic uh, perspective. Uh, I've talked to you already about uh, using training as, as an investment and how I think about that. Um, I've also been a big proponent at the company about the need for clinical evidence. For most medical device companies, there are early adopters who do not care what the data show. They're going to try any new shiny thing that comes by. Um, but most people want to see data, and I think it's important for a medical device company to provide that data or provide opportunities for that data to be published, and that there should be some academic rigor uh, around those publications. And then I communicate a lot with surgeons and societies. A lot of societies uh, would like to have efforts for training and efforts for research, so I talk to them about how the company might support them in those um, endeavors. So why did I do this? I am actually not an early adopter. I am not one of those people who is waiting for the new iPhone. Um, I actually used uh, my pager for many, many years after cell phones came out and would stop at gas stations to answer my pages um, long after my husband thought I was crazy. Um, but I was given an, uh, an unusual opportunity, kind of a perfect storm. I'd been promoted in, uh, to be a professor of surgery at Stanford. My husband is a lifelong uh, Californian, so I knew he wasn't going to go anywhere. And I was ready for a new challenge. And what I've heard is that, in general, every 10 years or so, uh, people want a new challenge in their life. And for surgeons, that's often moving more into administration uh, or perhaps getting an MBA or an MHA. I had considered moving more into education and getting a master's in education. Um, and this opportunity kind of came um, out of the left field. Um, and I thought it was an opportunity for me to um, teach something to the company, but me for also to learn a little bit how I could make a difference in a different way. Um, it is very unusual to have a chief medical officer who is in the late majority at a medical device company. Typically, they tend to get early adopters in. Um, but ultimately, in order for the company to be successful, they have to be able to get adoption in that early and late majority. And so I'd like to believe that I've been helpful to them in terms of understanding where they need to invest in order to get past um, that chasm. So what have I found to be helpful as I work with the, with the um, company? Um, they do have a sense that everything needs to be done right away. Oh my God, you know, we, we set ourselves this deadline of getting this prototype done by Friday. We're not going to get it done. We all have to stay up late. Oh my God, this, um, you know, we really want to be able to send out this marketing message. You have to stay up all weekend to get it finished. <coughs> And my philosophy is, boy, if somebody's not bleeding, it's not really an emergency. And they're all made up deadlines. It's not an NIH deadline. It is not a you know, patient with acute appendicitis. And so I think I bring a little bit of perspective um, to how otherwise people in the company can kind of wrapped up in that urgency of getting things done. Um, you have to make decisions with limited knowledge. You know, a company is making a medical device that isn't going to be on the market for five years. They have to have some idea of where, where the market's going to be in those five years, and you have to be comfortable making those decisions with minimal um, data. Um, you have to be able to appreciate the expertise of others. Um, the people who work at my company are incredibly intelligent and very creative problem solvers. And so it can't be a situation where I'm coming in there, I'm a surgeon, and therefore I can tell them what they should be doing. Um, and I think it's really helpful if you're working for a surgical device company to have an engineering background. I have really struggled when they start speaking engineering, and I have no idea what they're talking about. This is where I've struggled. Um, you know, I have a bias against sales and marketing. I think they're trying to sell me something. And so there was a lot of conflict between me and them for a long time. Um, I did lose my credibility as a surgical educator when I went over to industry, and that was particularly painful for me. I've not done a great job representing surgeons broadly, and I've tried to better understand the needs of surgeons in private practice as opposed to academics. Um, in the company, people tend to take my opinion as the end answer instead of realizing it is just one opinion and may not reflect everybody. Um, 
The best way, if you're at all interested in doing this, is with it, your own local representatives and the um, executives of that company, taking uh, opportunities to speak for them, to do research with them, to go in and evaluate their products. Um, that's how I did it, and I think um, that is the best way for you to be able to do it as well. But I do encourage you to network. There are actually a fair number of surgeons out there who have left and gone into industry, and they can help set up connections for you if that's something that you are interested in doing. Um, the things to think about is how much time do you want to do? It's hard to be a part-time surgeon, um, but sometimes it's best to start with a part-time commitment so that you can see if this is a company you like who shares your values and that they are going to like you. Um, I have kept my clinical practice. I've worked very hard to do that, although it's a very limited practice. I find that very rewarding, and so that was a, a huge goal for me. Um, and then what role do you want? You saw that I have many roles, um, so are there certain roles that you'd be more interested in than others? Um, and do be prepared for some very negative comments from other surgeons. And then just in conclusion, I really would encourage all of you to consider new career paths. I think it's incredibly invigorating to try something new and to be successful at it. It's rewarding. Um, it has to be the right time and the right place for you, uh, but I am obviously happy to give any advice or listen to you at any time that you might have about making such a change. Thank you.